When I was new to cultivation, I saw soil as dirt. It wasn't alive. It didn't have life, except for maybe worms, and I just filled pots with it. And it makes sense that I would think that because I was raised being taught to sterilize my soil with fire before using it in pots, and sterile soil is dead soil. I held on to that perspective for a long time. Then I started learning about the soil food web because I wanted to grow thriving cannabis plants. All it took was seeing just one Elaine Ingham diagram of all the life that inhabits wild soil to immediately jerk me out of that false reality, and I realized that soil was teeming with life, teeming with microbes and a host of other participants. And then I understood that complexity of life was everywhere, in soil, fresh water, the oceans, and the air. All this microbiology was all around me, and I was essentially swimming in it. And the more I read books and got educated, the more I realized that every minute player in living soil had an important role to play in the soil food web. And that seems beautiful to me. And if you're here with us listening today, you probably find it beautiful too. If you want to learn about cannabis health, cultivation, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you new podcast episodes as they come out, delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. Also, we're giving away very cool prizes to folks who are signed up to receive the newsletter. There's nothing else you need to do to win except receive that newsletter. So go to shapingfire.com to sign up for the newsletter and be entered into this month's and all future newsletter prize drawings. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Lose. My guest today is Dr. Ernest Bernard. Dr. Bernard is a plant and soil nematology researcher in the entomology and plant pathology department at the University of Tennessee. Looking at his professional resume, I see he was already a graduate assistant researcher in entomology at Michigan State University in 1972, which means that he has been studying entomology for longer than I have been alive. In 2010, he was awarded Outstanding Scientist of the Year for Biodiversity Education by Discover Life in America and a NACTA Teaching Award in 1999. Last year, he was awarded a team grant to study microplastics and the soil food web. Dr. Bernard has also served as co-author on several mycology publications and illustrated several papers on new occurrences of plant diseases, which is cool, right? Not only does he publish scientific papers, but he does the illustrations too. Finally, Ernie teaches a university course on classic film noir. Today, we're going to talk about nematodes, or nematodes as I learned it's properly pronounced. It is important to point out in advance that we really don't know very much about nematodes and cannabis yet. In fact, we don't really have a complete picture of nematodes at all. They are an under-researched participant in the soil food web. So my questions today lead us on a few paths which there are not solid answers for yet. And I'm very appreciative to Dr. Bernard for being vocal about where the science ends and pointing out fertile areas for new research. During the first set, we will talk about the physiology, habits, and life cycle of nematodes. The second set is all about the beneficial activities of nematodes, both as a pest predator and essential participant in the soil food web. And during the last set, we talk about parasitic nematodes and how to avoid them establishing in your garden. I spent over a year researching nematologists, looking for one who had the depth of knowledge on nematodes, was familiar with the cannabis plant, and was willing to talk publicly about both. And they're incredibly rare, right? There are not many people studying nematodes, fewer who are studying nematodes and cannabis, and nearly none researching nematodes, cannabis, and are willing to talk about it publicly. So special thanks to Joe Romanecki at the Entomological Society of America for helping me find Dr. Bernard. Welcome to Shaping Fire, Dr. Bernard. Uh, glad to be here, Sh- uh, Shango. It's uh It's a pleasure. So glad to have you. So, you know, at the very beginning, let's clarify something that is um, often confused in the cannabis cultivation scene. But as I was preparing for our interview today, it's actually, you know, kind of confusing for some people, even in the science literature, which is is a nematode an insect or not because you know people are often referred to them as worms but taxonomically they are classified with insects in the same clade and so to get us all on the same page would you would you kind of sort that out for us 
Well, I jokingly tell my students in, the, in my classes that if they use the term worm for nematodes, they're going to lose some points. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that comes about because they were originally known as roundworms. Uh, there's even a group of animal parasites called whipworms. Uh, so the word worm is in there, but it's okay as long as you say roundworms. Or in the, Britain, they say eelworms. Mm. But nematodes are actually their own phylum. They're a separate, completely separate group of organisms of a million species or more, probably, uh, well separated from the arthropods, which is where the insects are. The other arthropods are things like spiders, mites, crustaceans, lobsters, those sorts of things. Uh, however, in recent years, there, there is some uh, molecular evidence that there is some kind of relationship between the two groups because they both, they're the only groups that really shed their skins in order to grow. So, 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 but but they're not segmented, right? So they they're not no, they're not segmented at all. I mean, no one would expect them to be related, except the very most remotely, just like we would be to uh, uh, earthworms. But uh, there is some molecular evidence that they could be related. But you'd have to go way back, way back in deep time to to actually figure that out. And there there are basically no nematode fossils out there and hardly any insect fossils uh, that are earlier than 400 million years old. So if we want to be correct when we speak about nematodes and uh, they're, 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 you know, we'd lose points if we call them worm, um, <laughs> but they're not exactly insects. What, what is the best word for us to use to describe them? Let's call them nematodes. Just uh, give them, give them their just, own, their own category. Right. Okay. Very yeah, good. That's right. Okay. Thanks. So, I know that we're going to be talking about a smaller subset of the nematodes that exist um, today because, as you said, we think that there might be up to 100 million species, which is enormous. Um, what, well, a million. A oh, million. A, a, mi but, oh, a million. I said 100 that's, million. That's yeah. still, <laughs> still Well, lot. there could be. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, so we'll be talking mostly about the ones that interact with the, the cannabis garden today. But but generally, nematodes, What what is their range? Are they just about everywhere on the planet? Nematodes are everywhere where there can be a plant, bacteria, moss, or organic matter occurring. So anywhere you think of that's not covered permanently by ice and snow has nematodes. The, uh, in the Antarctic dry valleys, the highest forms of life there are three species of nematodes. Um, and you want to go up the tops of mountains. I've collected them off the tops of uh, you know, Haleakala in Hawaii and uh, several other places so they're everywhere right on they are they're literally everywhere and uh, every step you take outside uh, you are stepping on the homes of nematodes um i've read that they um outnumber other animal species both in individuals and in species counts pretty much everywhere they live and so it to, to tie this into cannabis container guarding would it um would it be fair to say that in our uh containers or beds where we're growing cannabis that there are more nematodes and more varieties of nematodes than anything else in the soil uh well, if you set up a container i assume you set it up with uh with basically sterile media or something that's been steam sterilized something like that. There'll be no nematodes there at the beginning. But gradually they come in. They are brought in by insects. They're, they're blown in in a dry form and will colonize the, the medium. Uh, however, the difference is you, you're not likely to get plant parasites in containers um, unless you're kind of sloppy and you're introducing field soil. So I would say that for this particular um, audience, that is exactly what we do. So uh, with with much <laughs> which much of the people, you know, I know your expertise is uh, with uh, with growing hemp, and so much of that world is sterilizing um, uh, the soil because it's going into this controlled environment, uh, usually of the greenhouse. Um, for most of the people who are listening to this show, though, they are. Uh, 
um, regenerative growers who are wild crafting inputs, um, uh, using no-till techniques for their pots, using last year's soil, uh, bringing in um, uh, fermented plant juices from the wild. So um, most of the people here have got pretty wild, uh, pretty wild soils. And the goal for <laughs> most of us is to um, try to, to keep that, that wild bronching bowl of soil um, in enough balance so that we can take advantage of the thriving um, living soil culture um, without it getting out of balance and then, you know, developing, you know, fusarium or whatever, whatever it may be. Right, right. So it sounds to me that if many of us are, uh, are, are including wild crafted bits, even, even if we started with, with a, um, a bagged soil, we're, we're, we're intentionally mucking it up um, ourselves. It sounds like there's all there. There is going to be a slew of both number and variety of species of nematodes in in all of our pots. It sounds like over time you'll end up with. Uh, I, it's hard to say how many will end up there. It depends on the surrounding environment and what is what is directly affecting those pots. What's flying in? What's blowing in? Uh, but. Yes, you'll end up with a variety, of primarily bacterial feeders, some fungal feeders, even some possibly some predators in there. Uh, if you get unlucky, you'll have you'll have a plant parasite that can attack uh, the plant plant roots. The especially if I'm not I'm not familiar with uh, with pot culture or of of hemp, but um, if you have other plants around that you're not too careful about, or in close proximity to affected fields. Then you run a greater risk of somehow accidentally introducing these nematodes. How much uh, do nematodes uh, travel uh, with with some uh, both you know, both pests and beneficial uh, um, life forms? You know, sometimes you can put pots pretty close to each other and they don't go from pot to pot. But then sometimes you, if there's too close, just simple splashing of water will spread them around. So, so what what is the distance of travel for a nematode usually? Well, nematodes don't aren't aren't exactly world travelers. Um, the fastest one <laughs> that I well, uh, why that that is such a general question. It depends on the kind of nematode. Uh, a lot of the bacterial feeders move at a pretty good clip, and it could probably travel a few centimeters uh, per day if they really were trying. Uh, plant parasites don't move very far. Uh, most none of them are really what you would call moving huge distances. I think the record is the burrowing nematode in Florida soils can move about three feet, but that's only in soil. They're not going to climb out of a pot and then climb up another pot and get in. However, yes, yeah, splashing water is a great way for them to get around. In fact, any kind of flowing water is good for moving nematodes. Uh, and they, they can rely passively on just a breeze if they happen to be in the right spot. If you have leaf litter that happens to have some have climbed on. Another problem is that some nematodes are, can undergo anhydrobiosis, which means they dry out, but they're still alive. They have a physiology that allows that, and those are easily blown around. Oh, I see. When they're dry and lighter, so so if we are experiencing a uh, a pest nematode issue, which we'll talk more about later, um, this is clearly a case where our first line of defense is going to be uh, material control. So right. uh, San- you know, don't sanitation. Yeah, sanitation. Don't spread your don't splash your water. Don't spread your soil um, when you're you know, don't let your leaf litter go from one plant to another. All all those basics. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it, there are so many uh, nematodes, and and from this point forward, we're going to start focusing more on the ones that interact with the cannabis plant. Um, you know, compared to the overall uh, nematode world of a million species, how many are are we generally going to be dealing with uh, in a living soil and cannabis environment? If you're talking about like field soil, um, which is what I would be most familiar with, I still would say it's a black hole because there's been basically no field research done uh, done yet. The crop is too new. Uh, nematologists are not really have not really geared up a lot to do that yet. Uh, but you would have the typical in a handful of soil. You'd probably have uh, 20 to 40 species 
of nematodes, some more abundant than others. In a whole field, you might be talking 200, 300, 400 species of nematodes, most of which would not be plant parasites, but would be predators or bacterial feeders or fungal feeders. So we're kind of at a black hole with regard to what is actually happening at this moment. Mm -hmm. So for for many uh, cannabis cultivators, we are most familiar with the um, with the the bugs of all varieties that we can see, right? Because right. Uh, when 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 you can see them, you're more aware of them. <clears throat> you know to look you look them up, and 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 generally they're easier to deal with when you can see them, um, and so and and because. Um, uh, microscopy skills are are still very much growing in the cannabis cultivation scene. Not a lot of people are putting their soil under uh, microscopes yet. Um, can you describe for us like the size relation of a nematode, if any of the ones that we're going to be talking about are we can actually see with the naked eye, and and maybe a little bit of what what they would look like if we did throw one under a microscope? Okay, uh, nematodes are. The word is actually, nematode comes from the word thread, is, that means thread-like in Greek. And uh, it's because you can actually see them with the naked eye, but all you see is a tiny little twisting white thing, maybe half a millimeter long to a millimeter. Some, some species in the soil do get up to a couple millimeters, but really they're quite small. You can't make out any detail like that. And they require, and they can also, people can also mistake those for the very small, uh, what are called enchytraid worms. They're true worms. They're white and very small, uh, small insect larvae. Um, so what do they look like under the... Oh, another thing I should mention is they don't... Nematodes don't uh, contract and, and elongate like an inchworm or an earthworm. Mm. They not, don't have the capability to do that. So what do you look like under the micro... Look for in the microscope. There is the, uh, there's no segmentation. So the, the body is not divided in major divisions. There is... Uh, <laughs> They're pretty simple. The, both ends are usually rounded. The tail end is not kind of pointed. Uh, the important part of a nematode is the mouth parts, which we call the stoma. Because once you see the stoma, you know exactly what that nematode does. If it's a wide, if it's a wide open stoma like a tube, it's taking a bacteria. If it's got a thing that looks like a hypodermic needle, it's called a stylet. It either is a plant parasite or a fungal parasite, or it could be a predator. And there are some with large teeth inside that are probably predators. So it, uh, the front end of the nematode is the business end as far as determining what it is. And one can determine that, one can determine that at uh, you know relatively low power, ten or twenty, uh, hundred, hundred uh, x would probably work. Uh, the problem is actually getting them out of the soil, and that's where we have specialized techniques for doing that. They're not complicated but they do involve a little bit of time and effort to float them out of the soil so you can actually get some. Fact, what, 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 I, what is that technique? For, okay. for, for gathering worms, we <laughs> I, talk often about adding you know, melons or avocados to the top of the soil, which pulls you know, regular earthworms up. But now you've, now you've got my attention here. What, what is this? What is this trick? <laughs> All right. Well, um, it's not really a trick, uh, but that watermelon thing is interesting. You probably, if you, uh, if you left that there for several days and drop pieces in water, you probably get some nematodes coming out that have been that were near the surface are attracted into it and are reproducing. That would be kind of cool. I gotta try, I'm gonna have someone try that. Um, so the technique we, we use is called uh, it's called uh, sugar flotation centrifugation. And it's a, probably more than what uh, most growers would want to do. But uh, what it is is you take a soil sample, like a handful of soil, you put it in a beaker, you fill it up to about thousand, about eight hundred mils, and you mix it up really well. Then you pour it through nested screens. We use an 80 over a 400. So a 400 mesh screen is about, uh, I think, 35 micrometer openings on the holes, maybe 25, I think it's 25. So very tiny holes. So the, the top screen, the 80 mesh, is about half a millimeter. It catches most of the debris, and you end up with the nematodes and the finer material on this very fine screen. So the bottom screen is to catch the nematodes. Then you put it. Then you rinse those into a centrifuge tube, spin them, spin them down, pour off the water, add a sugar solution, mix it up, and spin it again. The sugar solution has the same uh, density as a nematode body, 
So when you put it through the centrifuge again, the soil goes to the bottom of the tube, the nematodes stay in suspension, and we can pour that off. Uh, that's how we do it in our lab. But there are simpler methods involved. Um, and this, this might be really practical for people that don't, don't have a centrifuge and all the, uh, all the <laughs> other equipment. Is, um, it's, called a Berle- it's called a Behrman funnel. There's actually a variation also called a Behrman pan. But they're basically the same thing. You have a, a very fine screen or, or just kind of porous tissue. Uh, uh, <laughs> in fact, nematodes were once, once said to uh, be, be in operation as long as they had a funnel and a piece of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> so inside, so you have a funnel and you have a little screen inside that fits inside that funnel. And you just cut that out of anything, uh, aluminum screen or something. And then you lay a piece of uh, tissue over it. And it can really be just like one layer of Kleenex. You put your soil yeah, at the bottom of, this, of the uh, funnel, you attach a tube, like with a piece of rubber tubing. Attach a tube. Then you fill it up with water. You put in your screen, the tissue. Add your soil very gently on the top. Not very much. You want it to be kind of submerged. Make sure it's uh, damp or wet. The, nem- the active nematodes are gradually wiggle through to the bottom, fall through the uh, screen, and sink into this tube. And after two or three days, you can take that tube off and let's see what you got. Um, now, it requires active nematodes are active. And some of them, some of them aren't very active, but it, it will give a fair idea of what, what you might have out there. Right so, on. So, yeah, it's, it's, that's, that method has been around a long time. And and time. and I think you, and I and I agree with you that um, there are there are probably few uh, cultivators who are going to do the first version, and there's probably even few uh, um, uh, cultivators that would bother to do the second version. But the reason why I wanted it included is because if somebody's listening to this show because um, they are either curious to know you know to what number of nematodes they have in their um, in their growing environment, or if they suspect that they they're substrates being taken over by nematodes which we'll talk more about later um you know th- that that would be a great tool t- for you to for somebody to do that and go oh my god look at all these nematodes um i i think i need to look into this more so, so the, the other I, mm-hmm. I i should also point out the other thing they can do in that case and if it's uh if they're don't have a problem with it is they can send samples to their extension agent or extension offices every state has them and you've probably heard that before. For and, sure. And, uh, and get a nematode analysis done. And, and, you know, luckily these extension offices are becoming more and more comfortable with, with talking to us cannabis folks. So, right. uh, so hopefully, um, you know, your mileage may vary on that, but hopefully you get somebody <laughs> who's, who's open to us. So, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot on Shaping Fire is um, the, the, the living soil uh, food web and how um, the, the different participants in the rhizosphere are doing different jobs that when they all come together, um, you have a thriving, healthy soil that's in balance, that is not susceptible to, um, you know, disease outbreaks and, 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 you know, you'll have a really good uh, flower run and that's that's what we all shoot for um i don't think many of us understand the role that nematodes play in that that you know beautiful melody that is the soil so um would you kind of walk us through you know essentially day in a life a nematode what are they spending their time doing and uh, so so that we can understand their purpose a little better okay um well nematodes because they do have different feeding strategies, occupy a pretty broad range inside the so in the soil. So you have so if we start with the let's just start with the uh, we get leaf litter or other organic matter lying on the ground. It's gradually consumed by millipedes, isopods, earthworms, and it gets broken down. And uh, the fungi and bacteria then move in and are more efficient at at, uh, at decaying and consuming this tissue. Well, the nematodes actually come along then. The nematodes are there to begin consuming bacteria and fungi. So this helps to keep the cycle, keep the entire 
nutrient cycle going in the soil. So they're consuming uh, bacteria, fungi. Uh, some are predators that attack amoebae. Um, of course, some are insect parasites as well. And they consume those organisms and then they die. They become incorporated in the soil. At each level, we're getting a breakdown uh, that provides easier nutrition for plants. So you get this constant cycling organic matter um, of nutrition in the soil. So nematodes form an important step in that they're consuming fungi and bacteria that are engaged in the, uh, in the uh, digestion of organic matter. It, they sound, don't actually, it so sounds to me like that they would be very useful in regenerating um, out of balance, you know, cropland or, or or beds or something. It sounds like uh, they, you know, they are they are digesting machines. And if we're trying to clean up beds that have got you know bacterial outbreaks or something, that um, you know they they are essentially helping clean the environment and renew it constantly. It's nice that you met, uh, mentioned bacteria because if you have, because many of the bacterial feeders have very short lifespans or very short life cycles, some as little as two days. Oh wow! So from egg to adult, and so you can get huge numbers building up, um, not on exactly the same thing we're talking about. But we did a a, a graduate student at the University of Tennessee did a wonderful study on uh, on soil fauna. When cadavers are placed on top of the soil, we use beavers and human beings at the at the uh, uh, world famous body farm. We say yes, a and uh, we found s bacterial feeders exploded in enormous enormous numbers, uh, hardly detectable before they were put in there, and after two or three weeks, we had fifteen to twenty thousand in basically a handful of soil. So they respond very quickly to those kinds of. Uh, um, um, imbalances. Uh, so yeah, that that has not. I don't know how much that has been tried, but there have been some really good studies recently on the effect of of re of rebalancing uh, nematode communities in forests by various means, organic amendments or whatever. And it's found that it really has improved the health of the soil. It sounds like there's a lot of opportunities for research in nematodes right now. You've mentioned a couple different times that either either there's an opportunity somewhere or it's a black hole or the research is new. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it, it sounds to me that if, if, if somebody is, you know, interested in living soil and cannabis and, and they find nematodes interesting, that there's a lot of promising research to be done there. Oh, definitely. There's no end to it. Uh, and there aren't that many nematologists in the world. And most of us are uh, working on crop protection. So those that are working on basic ecological questions are not uh, as numerous. Oh, yeah, there, I, I, I and all my colleagues, we all have so many ideas that we're never going to get to. Just for sheer manpower or person power. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's about right. <laughs> right on. All right. So um, I think that just about uh, everybody who is here today is here to be talking about uh, beneficial nematodes. So so let's go ahead and wrap up this first set. And when we come back with set two, we're going to start off with, uh, with the meat of the pie there on the beneficial uh, nematodes. So we're going to take a short break and re be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Dr. Ernie Bernard. Now, without these advertisers, Shaping Fire would not happen. So please support them and let them know that you heard them on Shaping Fire. One of the challenges with buying autoflower seeds is that often you'll have as many different phenos as you will have seeds in a pack. That can be fun, sure, but so many varieties in one pack is a sign of an immature seed line that hasn't been worked enough. I prefer my autoflowers to be worked enough that each pheno in the pack really captures the aspects that the breeder was intending. This is why I recommend Gnome Automatics to my friends and listeners who grow automatic flowering cannabis seeds. Gnome Automatics seeds are not just crossed and released. They are painstakingly sifted again and again, tested in a wide range of conditions, and taken to a level of maturity that each plant will be recognizable by its traits. Traits that were hard-earned so that you can have your best growth cycle ever. Gnome Automatics became a trusted and loved brand in cannabis over the last 10 years as Mandalorian Genetics and recently changed their name to Gnome Automatics. 
The only thing that has changed is the name. Founder Dan Jimmy continues to pour his passion of breeding cannabis into every variety he releases for you to grow. Check out the Gnome Automatics Instagram at gnome underscore automatics to see the impressive plants folks are growing. You can score Gnome Automatic seeds in feminized or regular at your favorite seed provider listed in the vendor section of their website. Farms interested in bulk seeds of more than a thousand should reach out through the website too. While on the website, be sure to check out the Gnome Automatics shirts and other merch section. If you want reliable seeds, hand-built from effort, expert selection, and experience, choose Gnome Automatics. As cannabis regulations become more demanding and consumers become more educated, it is increasingly important to avoid the use of chemical pesticides when cultivating cannabis. Beneficial insects have been used for decades by the greenhouse vegetable and ornamental plant industry, and today many cannabis cultivators are moving from sprays and chemicals to beneficial insects. Copert has the beneficial insects, mites, and nematodes, microbials, sticky cards, and air distribution units you need to partner with nature to defend your garden. Whether you manage acres of canopy or have a simple grow tent in your home, Copert is ready to help answer your questions and help you transition away from chemical sprays towards clean and natural solutions. Since 1967, Copert has assisted growers in identifying pests and devising reliable solutions while providing healthy insects and mites that will protect your yield. Since the 1990s, Copert has been a leader in cannabis pest and disease control worldwide and have highly trained consultants to assist you in Canada and the United States from coast to coast. With their global network of grower support, Copert can help. Visit copert.com, choose your country, and get detailed information. That's copert, K-O-P-P-E-R-T dot com. For the most up-to-date cannabis-related biological control information, you can also check their Instagram at Copert Canada. You know getting away from pesticides is good for health and good for business, and Copert is ready to help. Visit copert.com today. A fully functioning greenhouse grows extraordinary cannabis flowers that have exceptional bag appeal, great terpene profiles, and exceptional yield. But as we have discussed many times on Shaping Fire, a greenhouse is only as good as the environment you create for the plants inside. Biotherm has been on the forefront of developing and installing highly efficient greenhouse solutions since 1980. Whether new construction, major upgrades, or a retrofit, Biotherm's cultivation climate solutions are tailored to each grower's specifications. They even have root zone heating mats that attach to a home hot water heater for growing areas 500 square feet or smaller. The atmosphere of the growing environment directly affects the health and productivity of your crop. Biotherm offers heating, cooling, dehumidification, and CO2 enrichment to optimize the air your plants breathe and optimize plant growth by enhancing the elements within the cultivation space. Biotherm's dissolved oxygen irrigation solutions will improve the vitality of your water and the efficiency of your hydro delivery system. When you implement Biotherm's systemic innovation, you'll experience increased yields, improved plant vigor, and increased resistance to disease and pests. Biotherm offers free phone and email support for everything they sell and will help you troubleshoot and diagnose issues to get your equipment back online. The explosion of greenhouse cultivation has crowded the field with novice consultants selling unproven gadgets. When you choose Biotherm to regulate your greenhouse environment, you know you're relying on their over 40 years of experience designing, installing, and supporting mission-critical greenhouse technology. Your plants deserve nothing less than Biotherm. Visit BiothermSolutions.com today to learn more and request a quote.
Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and my guest today is Dr. Ernie Bernard. So during the first set, we got a better idea of uh, who our neighborhood nematode is, a bit about their life cycle, what their interests are, and that there's so many of them everywhere in the world. Um, but here in the second set, we're going to focus more on uh, beneficial nematodes um, uh, in, in both how we can use the nematodes to um, protect our plants in the garden and the quality of soil and uh, and then also we'll, we'll talk a bit about making a uh, an environment that's good for them to live since uh, since they are our allies in uh, in sustaining uh, living soil so Ernie um, you know the number one thing that uh, people in cannabis cultivation turned to beneficial nematodes for is fungus gnats because you know lots of people um, they are they are inexperienced or they uh, and they and they overwater, or or they have got a, um, a a watering system that they find out too late is uh, watering a bit heavy, and boom, you've got fungus gnats, and and they're super annoying, <laughs> and 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 so people, their first thought is, okay, I'm, I need to use the nematodes. So so if you would kind of walk us through the relationship between uh, fungus gnats and their and their production of larvae and where the nematodes go come in to be a, a helpful participant in our garden yeah <laughs> sirens fungus gnats definitely um a problem that about everybody has that grows anything i know we have them in our greenhouse and we also have a lot of uh millipede cultures going in the lab for various reasons and we get plenty of fungus gnats in there can't seem to help it um so the larvae of fungus gnats and I'm not a specialist on these, but what, what I do know is they eat uh, rotting organic matter. And so uh, a lot of wet organic matter will mean a lot of fungus gnats developing, especially if it's on the surface. Um, I don't know that some of your listeners probably know better than me whether they actually attack cannabis roots themselves. I think some of them will. Uh, the nematode being talked about, I don't recall the name of it, but it is an enemopathogenic nematode. I know it's available commercially quite a bit. That's uh, applied to soil that will infect those fungus gnat larvae and kill them before they become adults. Um, as long as the, I'd say, as long as the instructions are followed carefully, they should work fine. When you use the word infect, um, uh, are we actually meaning like eat the larva? They'll eat the larva? Or is there okay. some kind of yeah. viral or bacteria that's passed? I'm not sure how to, to take the word infect. Right. And if I, I can't quite remember the name of the species. Maybe you have it at hand there that attacks fungus gnats. Uh, but typically these nematodes are they're produced as um, anhydrobiotic juveniles. So they're dried out. They're in a dry state. They're added to soil surface and wetted. This revives them. They take water up and they begin moving around again. And they have they carry in their in the anterior part of their intestine a certain kind of bacterium. Mm. When they enter, when they locate a fungus gnat, they enter the the larva through an, a natural opening. It, I'm not sure on this one. It could be through the spiracles where they how they larvae breathe. It could be uh, through the back end. They might even wiggle it through the mouth. I'm not sure. But they get inside, and they defecate these bacteria. The bacteria multiply rapidly, prodigiously. And that's what actually kills the larva, the consumption of the uh, tissues inside. Wow. Once they've consumed those, uh, well, while they're consuming those, now the nematodes are inside. They start feeding crazy, crazily on these bacteria because that's their food source, not really the gnat itself. Then they uh, reproduce very quickly within a few days, producing hundreds of thousands of new eggs that uh, can later begat, uh, will ha infect, uh, will hatch and produce infective larvae. And so this is this is why uh, nematodes are good both. You know, if you have an outbreak, and 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 also as a defensive mechanism to keep you from ever getting fungus gnats, because if you've got a large population of nematodes, they're constantly eating their way through larvae and depositing this bacteria, which, which I'm guessing and hoping that this bacteria is also probiotic for the for the rhizosphere. Ah, well, here's the catch: the bacterium only survives inside the nematode. Oh wow! So, so when these uh, so 
envision a nematode, a female nematodes inside the the larva of the uh, uh, of the fungus gnat. They're producing lots and lots of eggs. Those eggs hatch inside the larva of the the, the fungus gnat larva, and they're eating prodigiously. Now, some of them will go to maturity and, and produce more eggs, but most of them will will stop. They'll reach a point. And there's a trigger inside with too much, too many nematodes and not enough bacteria or something, and they stop development. And uh, they, un as the larva of the fungus gnat larva dies, these these larvae then begin to dry up, but they can they hold within part of their intestine. They hold some of these bacteria. So now they are a package just waiting for another larva to come along under favorable circumstances uh, that they can penetrate. So yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the rub about these bacteria is they're not free living. That's really interesting too, though. Like what a what an amazingly specific evolved system and tool that is, right? It's like it, carrying. It, Carrying your lunch with you when you move across country. That's right. It's really nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right. So another thing that sounds uh, uh, that that makes uh, nematodes seem like an obvious uh, player against these fungus gnats is that if if I understand correctly, like nematodes mostly live near the top of the soil, right? So they live exactly where the fungus gnat problem is. Right. That's that's where you'd like to have them. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's these uh, these these kinds of insect parasitic nematodes usually have a a way to track prey. Um, there are two different groups: there's ambush predators, and there are uh, uh oh ambush and there's another group that that actually seeks them out. They they move around, and I'm not using the right term. One group just sits waiting. Some just sit waiting for a, a, a particular host to come along. The other ones are called. Um, that's embarrassing. One, one way or another, they chase. <laughs> they chase, yeah. <laughs> Um, so um, so let, let's let's move on to another um, uh, variety of, um, of of pest that that people tend to turn to nematodes for. Now, um, you know, in the in the the general nematode scientific literature, you know, Western flower thrips are named as one of the um, you know one of the pest varieties that beneficial nematodes can be used against. And and you know, it is common for cannabis cultivators to read Western flower. Thrips, and even though I'm not aware of Western flower thrip being a threat in cannabis, we all see that word thrip, right? And we right. and we all have such problems with thrips, and and we're we're really looking for good solutions that that people use the nematodes for for you know the cannabis thrips that we get, but I've never actually seen the the evidence that that. That is an appropriate matchup. Are you familiar with um, you know any any system where the nematodes will go after our cannabis thrip varieties? Well, there are thrips. There are thrips that attack. Thr <laughs> there are nematodes that attack thrips, but I've not studied them really very much. I would love to know if that really works because our our greenhouses have a lot of uh, greenhouse thrips, and uh, the black, the dark brown ones are really bad. So, so I, no, your, I can't oh, provide any information on that. Sure, really. that's that's cool. Like we said, you know, there, there's there, the the study of nematodes is a huge area, and and I don't, I don't expect you to have something on everything, <laughs> but but I do know that you know uh, you have uh, studied um, you know their interaction with the hemp plant, and 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 I don't know um, how uh, wide the research is there that you've had the opportunity to do because like as we've already discussed, there's there's a lot of different research to do, but what what I'm getting at is, um, have you, um, uh, what other pests other than fungus gnats can you share with us that nematodes are effective in combating? There are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, nematodes out there now and available commercially for all kinds of uh, pests, grubs, fly lar other fly larvae, um, caterpillars. There's a wide range of product available now f that can be that can be used, or at least tried anyway. Uh, they have, a lot of them have kind of specific environmental requirements. There has to be enough water, not too much, uh, temperatures and things like that, the way that they're applied. Um, 
But, uh, oh, fleas. Fleas can be controlled this way. Um, so, but but each, each pest pretty much has its own particular nematode that can attack it. Like several different kinds of caterpillars have one species. Uh, beetle grubs might have a different species. And there may be variants in there. Um, I see. So, so I think I was. I think I was actually approaching this from the wrong direction because what what I'm hearing is that there, you know, if if there's if there's a million or more species, and 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 I'm getting the idea that nematodes tend to be, um, you know, uh, picky eaters when it comes to. Um, um, other animals uh, that that really what should happen is the the cultivator should find figure out and identify what their pest is and then kind of reverse engineer it to find what nematode is specific for theirs so it, it, it isn't like oh all right we're going to add you know you know this one nematode which eats you know 20 variety of pests and we're just going <laughs> to dump them on it it actually ta- takes some homework to make sure that we get the specific nematode that is correct for uh, whatever our pest would be yeah you've got it there are so there are many different species of uh, insect parasitic nematodes out there but they're they're not uh, they're not generalists they may take a, a small range of pests uh, but you won't find any one key, one that will take care of everything. I certainly wouldn't apply um, something used for beetle grubs to try and throw thrips. That's just that's total waste. Then, in fact, they're very different kinds of they're very different nematodes. I think that uh, some of us who got into beneficial uh, insects by learning about um, you know predatory mites that will um, eat our pest uh, t- uh, two spot. Um, uh, spider mite. You know, you see the list. It's like, oh, if I add this mite, it eats these. You know, it attacks these nine different varieties of pests. <laughs> and um, I, I think that I was approaching nematodes as like, okay, which one? Which nematode is the generalist that I want to focus on? And that's that's not really the right way to think about it. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. So- yeah, yeah, it's funny that I, I have to I have to mention this about using mites uh, to control insect pe- or control two spotted mites. So we, uh, we occasionally we have two spotted mite outbreaks um, and thrips outbreaks in our greenhouses, and we we do apply bio bio controls. They're spe- specific for these pests. Well, I was watching once. There was a nice thrip sitting there on a on the bottom of a leaf, and a and a predaceous mite comes along, approaches it. It touches the thrips. The thrips wiggles. The mite runs away. <laughs> he, <laughs> he wasn't supposed to do that. It's like, dude, play your position. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> All right. So, so if um, if my approach with a looking for a nematode generalist wasn't accurate, let's kind of uh, change the direction of the conversation okay. to creating an environment um, in the soil that will um, attract. And um, and provide a good home for the nematodes that we want because I'm starting to get the idea that um, you know if 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 a soil is in balance it will naturally have healthy nematodes and then if we let our soil get out of balance um, we start to develop parasitic nematodes which we're going to talk about in the third set so what is the living environment that um, you know the the beneficial nematodes that we want to have thrive in our pots as our defense mechanism. Um, what, what is that environment that they do best in, and 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 what can we do to uh, make it a cozy place where they want to um, produce? Well, um, wow, that's a good question. That's a big question. Um, what would I do if I want to grow really good cannabis or any crop, really? Um, I would have uh, a lot of organic matter. I would keep it well, uh, keep the nutrition high in the pot. I would avoid overwatering and underwatering, especially overwatering. Um, that is such a broad question. And what you're See, that, what you're essentially describing is 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 good container gardening, right? Right. right. And so oh, yeah. and so it sounds to me like like so long as you are um, are, are doing the things that we know help with um, 
with organic growing um, and and you're not out of balance like you're, you're not too dry you're not too wet you're not your your pH isn't off for the plant uh, you're you're making sure to uh, use compost teas uh, to, you know so long as you're doing the things that we in the regenerative community like naturally do anyway for the good of the right. plant those are all the same things that a nematode wants as well that's for the bacterial feeders the well all nematodes would be happy with that. In a container type situation, you're going to end up largely with bacterial feeders and fungal feeders in the pot, and that's um, and those are the those are the nematodes that are responsible for getting good uh, carbon nitrogen ratio. I don't. I there's uh, some very complicated research, very good research that was done out at UC Davis on on this approach of a balance of bacterial and fungal feeders. Um, so yes, you'll get both kinds in there because they're naturally brought in gradually by other insects. They're blown in the uh, rain. I mean, they can be picked up and carried by wind out of a field. The plant parasites you're not likely to get um, unless unless there's a breakdown in the way that you handle your stuff. So so let's say that like you know I, I I want to have the nematodes in my pot and there is the way that you just suggested by you know letting them get there by happenstance mm -hmm. but um, but let's say that that I want to intentionally um, you know equip the pot with it so as we've already talked about there's there are commercial varieties that are available um, what I'm curious to know is 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 it possible to you know add the nematodes and create a um, a self-replicating community where they are making more nematodes uh, you know into the future or 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 um, is their life cycle such I don't know maybe it's maybe it's too short or they don't reproduce enough or or whatever there might be about their life cycle where I, I should be adding nematodes because you know some some of some of the providers they suggest that you're you're hand adding nematodes every two weeks and and if that's what's necessary okay fine but but in my head and in the head of most of us into uh, into living soil growing we would love to have there be a community of nematodes that like reproduces it and maybe even expands and and so we add them once but keep our soil good and and now we've got nematode nematode defense mechanisms forever like is that unreason <laughs> is that unreasonable how do no actually i i would every two weeks means you're not effective at all um mm. i would think that uh addition initial addition as long as the pot is fine and you have uh you're going to have soil that's naturally being colonized by bacteria and fungi they're just blowing it out of the air in the water supply so those are already present adding the nematodes they will they they should reproduce and continue to grow to a population that is sustainable inside the pot if they get too if they run out of food their numbers are going to drop it's just the supply demand thing and um, until that builds up again and then they will increase I don't I don't see why they would not why they would not maintain themselves in these pots. Is there any reason um, to add a food source for them? Um, you said that if, if they grow in number where they outstrip their food source, they'll just um, you know die or not reproduce as much. Um, but I can, I can totally hear the listeners who are saying, yeah, but I want to supercharge my pot with nematodes. So can, is there a bacteria that I can add so they'll eat more of it? And you know I can see how that could be a dangerous <laughs> road to go yeah. under. But, but but let, but let, let's let's ask the question anyway. Is is there anything that we would want to feed the nematodes specifically like that, or or is feeding the nematodes just keeping your pot in balance? I think keeping your pot in balance. I'm not sure what you would feed them with. Would you pour a bacterial broth in there, or, or shove? Uh, I mean, I know that sounds dangerous, but that is what uh, yeah. I was imagining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm not sure that. I'm not sure how well that would work because you can rely on the naturally rapid reproduction of bacterial feeders, somewhat slower the fungal feeders, but you can rely on them to actually occupy their niche in that pot and all the places they can go, and they'll be there. And it may fluctuate up and down, but that depends on the, on the, the um, background food sources. They're living off, you know, dead, dying roots or old cells or uh, other organisms that might get in there 
Now, I, I, I've never heard of anyone actually augmenting a pot uh, and getting a result, but then again, the literature is pretty vast, so I could miss miss something. And, That's and, interesting. And also, you know, the people the people in in the regenerative cannabis scene were kind of mad scientists, and so <laughs> you know, I, I, I it would not surprise me at all that that somebody out there is all like, oh, well, if they if they if they um, if they eat bacteria, what is what is a bacteria that I can produce, and then they just start experimenting with it because because you know we all kind of consider ourselves citizen scientists even though it gets us in trouble sometimes. Oh no, I think I think any kind of uh, experimentation whether it's formal or just trying stuff is great. Um I mean how do we learn how do we learn anything if we don't do that? So this is a, this is kind of an uh, uh, kind of a, a non sequitur corollary question, and um, but so we'll just we'll see if you we, we, you've got something for me on this. You know, uh, very often um, uh, people are directed to um, add nematodes to their crops uh, through a sprayer. Um, and uh, there is a lot of discussion with not a lot of clarity about um, the varieties of sprayers or, or, or nozzle types to not use because some of the higher pressure ones uh, can you know, rip apart the nematodes as they're going through the nozzle is what I have been told. But I, I don't have first-person experience with this. So um, have, are, do you have anything to share with us about um, you know, um, application by spray best practices at all? I, I don't have anything specific on that, but the products, that when they're sold, they should have a recommendation for what kind of sprayer to use. I certainly want to use a super high-pressure one or one that puts out really fine droplets. For a small operation, maybe you could mix it up in a watering can and just water it in. So, um, as far as like the living environments for the nematodes, um, um, we a lot of us like to mix up our own our own soil with uh, different amendments. So it's you know kind of a uh, it's 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 perfectly made for our beloved cannabis plants. Um, are there any soil amendments um, uh, that are specifically appreciated by nematodes? Well, uh, it never hurts to have uh, organic matter of some kind in there. In our greenhouse, we use um, we use commercial a commercial uh, mix that we buy in bulk. Uh, buy we die ten or twelve bales at a time, um, and that I don't know how directly that affects them, mm -hmm. but allows for allows for better drainage. We use we use basically pure sand with organic matter in it, and uh, the organic matter actually helps. You'd think that sand would drain really fast, but organic ma some organic matter there really helps to drain it. It just provides helps provide channels uh, for them to move around in. Yeah, and that makes sense. Um, being worm-like, I can imagine that they would not like um, compacted soil, and and that you know that kind of starts us down where we're going to start with uh, the next set, where compacted soil is going to decrease their ability to, to move around, and right. compacted soil also creates hydrophobic soil on the top. And um, I'm getting the idea with since nematodes interact so effectively with water that they really do need a a moist but not not sopping uh, environment. Well, you hit one of the key points about nematodes. Nematodes are actually aquatic animals. They require a water film to move around in. In fact, when they move, they're pushing against a water film on a soil particle. And uh, they have no way of burrowing through soil themselves. They need to have the connections, the uh, connectedness of the soil pores in order to get around. So, yeah, you're right. A very highly compacted soil is pretty much impervious to most, but all the to all but smallest nematodes. It would seem then that uh, this would also be a case for um, like a, a living green mulch. Some people will, might call it a cover crop or something, but it, so, you know, small plants that live below the cannabis plants that have got roots going down that create um, highways for the water to go from the surface uh, and, and down into the rhizosphere. It sounds like that kind of a, a living, moist root environment between would be one that nematodes would be like hell yeah we, we like living here <laughs> yeah. well that also provides additional uh food source more roots uh means more bacteria growing on the roots uh more fungi attacking attacking uh dead cells or even the live roots themselves so sure and probably more variety too since these different plants are very likely to have different types of bacteria on the roots than the cannabis plant exactly and 
you know, there's a lot of specificity now we're finding out about bacteria on roots, and and uh, there is some specificity, specificity for nematodes that eat bacteria that may favor one kind of bacterium over another. So, so before we go to the second commercial break, I want to talk a little bit about um, who would predate our ally nematodes, right? So we're going through all this process. We might, you know, we're, 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 we're either attracting nematodes or we're adding nematodes. We're trying to keep our, our soil in balance, both for the plant, but also for, for all of our, you know, beneficials that are in the soil, including the nematodes. But, you know, I understand how the tree of life works enough to know that somebody's <laughs> probably eating my nematodes. So, so who, who are the threats to my beneficial nematodes in the pot or just anywhere that's that's a good question they there's a big uh, big disparity between those that have uh, get in pots easily like uh, bacterial and fungal feeders and predators the bacterial and fungal feeders have very short lifespans uh, but they lay a lot of eggs the predators are are have much longer lifespans they lay fewer eggs they're also not a, they're not nearly as I don't know portable or transportable as the other nematodes are. So it would be kind of uncommon to see uh, most predators in those pots. The other thing about the predators, um, something to keep in mind too, is that we're talking predator-prey relationships with nematodes. It's no different for them than it is for like mammals, looking at lynxes and snowshoe rabbits. You have, uh, you have a large prey population, you have a small predator population. And because of the differences in length of life cycle, number of eggs produced, they stay pretty much in those proportions. Uh, I've never heard of, uh, let's say, a predator population overwhelming um, the prey. There's always more prey coming along than there are predators. Well, uh, that is both surprising and good to hear because good to hear. That's yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. If we're gonna if we're gonna be, um, you know, uh, focusing on making sure that we've got enough nematodes uh, in our growing environment, um, the idea that that they will just be there effectively unless we kill them, um, like that, that sounds that sounds pretty good. So, um, what happens uh, to uh, you mentioned a little bit of this in the first set, but I want to dig in a little more. What happens when the environment does fall out of balance? You know. Know, like, like there are varieties of microbes, et cetera, who if if the soil gets dry or the pH changes or something, they'll cyst up and 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 do what we kind of think of as hibernation with a protective outer shell of some you know of a, of a mucus or something. Um, until the the conditions in the soil are favorable again, right? And then and right. then they then they restart their life cycle. And um, I'm curious to know what um, what defense mechanisms nematodes have for that. A because I want to hear you talk about that that body drying out cycle again. Okay. But also I, I want to get a better handle on the idea that if if I um, you know inadvertently drowned my pot um am i actually going to wipe out the nematodes or do i just need to wait for them to come back so i guess it's a combination question well let's talk about the the uh, flooding first um back in the 50s and 60s all kinds of things tried to kill nematodes and one of them was flooding let's flood a field and see how long it takes to kill all the nematodes it does work but you've also you've also ruined your field um, <laughs> fl fl temporary flooding is not going to really damage your nematodes very much they're aquatic organisms, and they, they take in oxygen, but they can become quiescent, which just means they stop moving, and they just stay quiet and just wait it out until the water drains away, more oxygen is available again, and they can begin moving around again. It'd be pretty difficult to do that unless you uh, set a pot in a, a cistern or something, fill it up with water, and just wait. <laughs> like did it intentionally, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as far as drying out, um, the thing about soils drying out is you never really get them dry. They feel dry, but they still have a thin film of water around all the soil particles, held on very, very strongly. And the nematodes themselves are held strongly in that, in that very, very thin layer of water and can't move. But it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to, to die because the pot has dried. Now, if you, if you really let it go a long time to where it's really getting dry, the nematodes, uh, many nematodes, not all, but many, can undergo this process called anhydrobiosis, which means life without water. Uh, they undergo physiological changes that push uh, certain compounds into their, into their proteins to keep them 
they're deforming. And then they, they, they lose almost all their water, 95% of their water, and they just sit there basically dry as dust. But when water returns, and this could be months or years later, oh. uh, I think the record is, oh, I better not say, I think it's more than 15 years. Mm. They Once water comes back, they revive in anywhere from minutes to hours and just pick up like nothing ever happened. Wow. Well, that's that's really convenient. I'm glad to hear <laughs> that. Is that. nice, isn't I, it? Yeah, I'm glad to hear that they they're so likely to to rebound because um, you know honestly it is so common. Uh, you know, maybe maybe not at a in a you know in an automated uh, commercial setup, but so much of of, of our audience is home growers and patients right. who are are growing their own cannabis for their own ailments, and, and and it is it is sadly very common for us to go from a from a uh, an overwatered a drowned pot to oh gosh I added too much I better not water it for a couple of days and then now now it's on the other side and it's bone dry because they were trying to make up for <laughs> for the overwatering in which case now it's hydrophobic and then we drown it again right like you know I made, I'm yeah I made a mistake once in the greenhouse I was adding uh, just we use Peters as a supplemental uh, fertilizer and I I added too much uh, inadvertently I hope and when I looked at the plants the next day they were all wilted and I thought I don't want to lose these young these young hemp plants so I just watered the heck out of them to wash that fertilizer through and sure enough they revived so it's it's not a total loss. Well, that's great because there's so many other ways for us to make mistakes and kill everything in our pots. It's it's nice to know that um, somebody's got the ability to rebound a little better than some <laughs> of our other allies. So, all right. So uh, let's go ahead and take a commercial break. We, when we come back, we are going to talk about uh, parasitic nematodes, uh, what many of us consider pest nematodes, even though they're uncommon. We're gonna we're gonna learn about them, and uh, and and talk about what they're like. So. Um, you are listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Dr. Ernie Bernard. For years, organic cultivators have been looking for a peat moss replacement. Peat moss has long been the go-to soil amendment for water retention and container growing, but organic growers are recognizing now that peat moss is an unsustainable resource, and the mining of peat bogs destroys wetland habitats and releases sequestered carbon but peat moss works so well that many have continued to use it. Now there is finally a revolutionary replacement for peat moss that provides better benefits while being a sustainable choice. Pit moss sounds and acts like peat moss, but instead of being mined from fragile ecosystems, is actually made from upcycled organic paper and cardboard headed for landfills. Pit moss is excellent at retaining water in your substrate and creating air pockets and tiny living environments for microbes. Pit moss instantly increases aeration, nutrient absorption, and water conservation too. Carefully and locally sourced, pit moss is the result of decades-long research into the use of recycled paper fibers. Pit moss is lightweight and easy to use, and pit moss is inert so it won't change your pH. Available in a range of preparations, including a nutrient-enhanced blend and an organic soil conditioner with no added nutrients. Pit moss is also available as an animal bedding for horses, chickens, and small animals. You can save 15% with the discount code SHAPINGFIRE, one word, no caps, when shopping on pitmoss.com. So go to pitmoss.com now to learn more. That's P-I-T-T-M-O-S-S dot com. Growing healthier, stronger, more sustainable plants. Pit moss. Once you've discovered the benefits of using cannabis, it's a very small step to start making your own edibles, gummies, lotions, tinctures, and concentrated oils at home. Magical Butter has been helping cannabis consumers become self-sufficient for over a decade. With the easy-to-use Magical Butter Countertop Botanical Extractor, you can create high-quality cannabis products to your exact specifications at a fraction of the cost of store-bought edibles. I talk a lot on this show about the importance of home growing so you don't have to rely on others to feel healthy. Well, the Magical Butter Machine can empower your personal health by putting you in control of how you use cannabis in your daily life. I've been making my own butters and oils on the stove for years, and I much prefer the ease of using the Magical Butter Machine. I just set it and walk away. 
With the simple touch of a button, the magical butter machine grinds, heats, stirs, and steeps your herbal extract all at the correct time interval and temperature for the perfect infusion every time. As a result, you achieve your desired infusion easily, safely, and consistently. Check out the Magical Butter Instagram to see the machine in action. And don't feel like you have to go it alone. There is a huge community on Facebook called Magical Butter Users United, sharing recipes and best practices so you can learn at your own pace from others who are already doing it successfully. Now is the time to get your own Magical Butter machine and save money while enjoying cannabis. Use the discount code SHAPINGFIRE, one word, no caps, to get 10% off. Visit MagicalButter.com today. There are so many seed banks nowadays that you really have options in who to choose. Not only that, if you pick the wrong seed bank, you could be in for a really sketchy ride. And that's only one of the reasons I recommend Hembra Genetics Collection to my friends and listeners who are looking for a seed bank. That's Hembra, spelled H-E-M-B-R-A. Hembra is not just another seed bank. Hembra is a woman-operated boutique cannabis genetics provider that only sells thoughtfully curated seeds from the top names in cannabis breeding. With over 50 breeders and over 500 strains to choose from, you will certainly find something you'll love. Hembra Genetics has something for everyone with over 350 feminized strains, 200 regular varieties, and over 100 autoflowers to choose from. Names you know you can trust like Humboldt Seed Company, Night Owl, Canarado, In-House Genetics, Fast Buds, and Gnome Automatics. We both know that there are other seed banks who will take your money but have no customer service. I invited Hembra to advertise on Shaping Fire after hearing so many good stories about them from my friends. They have A-plus customer service with lightning-fast response times. In most cases, Helene and Caitlin will get your order out the same day you place it, and you'll usually receive your seeds in just a few days. Most seed banks are simply not this organized or interested in getting your seeds to you this fast. But Hembra cares. You even get free seeds with every order. Helene and Caitlin get it. They have been in the cannabis growing scene for over a decade. So save a few bucks by using this discount code too. Use the code SHAPINGFIRE, all one word, at checkout to save 10% off your order. Buy seeds from good folks who will get you great seeds reliably every time. Visit HembraGenetics.com today. That's Hembra Genetics. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and my guest today is Dr. Ernie Bernard. So here we are in set three, and we are going to talk about the parasitic nematodes, which I actually thought were a lot more common than, um, than Dr. Bernard has kind of suggested earlier in the show. But let's talk about them because they're the bad guys, and we should be prepared uh, with them. So, you know, mostly what I understand about these parasitic nematodes is that they like to eat the roots and slow the growth of the plant. And I also kind of get the idea that they are are way more common um, that uh uh, then I think we we think they are because most people um, interpret what's happening with the plant as a nutrient problem. So will you will you go through these plant parasite nematodes and and kind of explain how they're they're working against us in the rhizosphere? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, so plant parasite nematodes are very common; they're everywhere. If you can look out a window and see some grass or, or forest or trees, there are plant parasitic nematodes feeding on those plants. Um, but in a, in a kind of a balanced environment, let's say a dis- undisturbed forest or even a, a, a long-term meadow, they're all in balance. They're, not, they're taking their little share of food, but it's not enough to really hurt, really damage anything. It's when we go to uh, monocultures, uh, high intensity agricultural production that we begin to see that these nematodes begin to dominate because we are removing uh, a lot of the constraints that, that, that keep them down, such as other parasites, other predators, uh, uh, diseases of nematodes, fungi that attack nematodes. And, and they become more predominant because we've altered that uh, natural arrangement in, in uh, that has been developing for millions upon millions of years. So plant parasitic nematodes are also called phytoparasitic, or abbreviated, we call them PPNs because we get tired of saying 
plant parasitic mm-hmm. nematodes. Um, they they all have uh, uh, their mouth is tra- the mouth is modified into a needle like structure. It looks just like a hypodermic needle actually uh, that they use to puncture roots. When they puncture roots, they invent, they in- inject enzymes that dissolve the contents of root cells. Then they suck that back out. That's their food. Uh, some nematodes just feed on the surface of roots. These are not of much consequence. They're called ectoparasites because they're on the outside. We also have uh, endoparasites. Uh, one group of endoparasites enters the roots and migrates around in the outer tissues, the cortex, just feeding as they go, laying eggs in there, and uh, they're more important than the ectoparasites. We also have the what are called the sedentary endoparasites. These are nematodes that enter a root find a nice spot in the vascular tissue, the xylem or the phloem, establish a specialized feeding site by the by injection of various plant hormones or plant hormone analogs, or they get the plant to do it. They produce the specialized feeding cells, and then the, they settle down there, protected from the environment because they're inside the root, and can produce lots and lots of eggs. Those are the most important ones because they're directly taking photosynthate and nutrients from the plant by their feeding. So, in nature, let's say if I, I'm near the Great Smoky Mountains, if I go up in the Smokies and sample around a tree, I'm going to find all these kinds. They're all there, but they're not in really high numbers because they're balanced out with everything else in the soil. So this, this is a phenomenon we call soil stasis, where everything is kind of checking everything else to make sure nobody gets out of control. Um, and so it's when we when we begin to manipulate the environment, we begin to see problems. It would make sense to me that these plant parasitic nematodes or PPNs are more common in monocultures or in, um, you know, especially aggressive, um, you know, commercial environments because uh, both of those varieties are intentionally trying to maximize growth by intentionally having the biosphere be out of balance, right? There's not- right. It's, it's solid. It's solid host root is what it is. And it's, uh, it's a perfect environment. There's, uh, the more diverse a plant community is, the less likely any nematode is to become dominant. But in a monoculture, uh, the food is everywhere. So, um, so, so, if we were to take the the opposite, which would be either, you know, um, a, a, a living a, a living soil versus hydro, meaning like you know, so so not hydro, but like a living soil commercial cannabis environment that that it might be beds. Or living soil pots, or a a home grower, or you know, like a like an outdoor craft grower in California. The one thing that all these people have in common uh, is that they are all trying to keep their soil complex. And the very act of trying to keep our soil complex sounds like it itself is the best defense against plant parasitic nematodes. I guess it. I guess it means. I guess I. I wonder what complex means. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, amendments and things like that will definitely be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Meaning, you know, uh, yeah. lots of uh, 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 top dressing with mulches and compost teas, right. and um, you know, uh, uh, you know, inoculant with uh, mycelium to make sure that you've got a good fungal environment, and um, you know, all all the things that uh, folks who are doing their best to cause a thriving, complex living soil to do, which is what our you know variety of cultivator does for the plant right so it sounds like by taking trying to take care of the plant soil as best possible um we are also acting as a uh, a natural defense mechanism against these parasites yeah there's a lot of good evidence out there for the use of uh composting uh soil amendments and rotations um that like I, I'm talking about a rotation would be like a wheat soybean rotation mm-hmm. in in one year that uh, really do significantly reduce plant parasitic nematodes. I was thinking about that earlier because there's the, you know there's not really a lot of crop rotation in um, cannabis either either in uh, licensed or unlicensed because uh, in the licensed in, uh, environment um, your space is so controlled by the the regulatory part of your license like right. where, where right. you're growing how much canopy you've got you know how much how much you can afford to fence right. 
right? So, so there's a lot more of re, you know repeated growing in the same location, and uh, similarly, people use the same pots over and over again. But, but you know, the reading I was doing in preparation, you know, the 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 three season crop rotation seemed to be like the number one suggestion for folks so that you you mix up the food sources to discourage these parasitic nematodes. And and you know, th- there seems to be this uh, you know, it could be suggested, oh, we should do that too. But it really doesn't sound like parasitic nematodes are enough of a problem to justify that effort. Yeah, the jury is out on that. Um, the pro- going historically, I think you've seen the paper that or heard my presentation before. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> when you go back um, with the uh, regulation of cannabis, so that it really wasn't grown at all from the 1930s on. This eliminated an entire uh, how many 60, 70 years of research. Then that's when nematology was really taking off. So the first report, the first report of plant parasitic nematodes was in t- on on hemp in the U.S. was in 1935, and right after that, of course, uh, production was shut down except for you know wartime ex- uh, necessities, things like that. So nothing was done on it, and consequently, we don't have enough we don't have enough history yet working on it to know whether uh, PPNs are going to be uh, a severe problem in um, in production of cannabis. We do know that there are some that will really attack it uh, based on some European research and some Indian research. But as far as here, we don't know yet. We the jury has to. We have to say the jury is still a little bit out. Well, if if that if that if that research uh, still hasn't come to conclusion yet, I know that this. I'm about to ask you a, uh, you know, an, an estimated guess question. But but let, <laughs> let's say that we do find that that um, PPNs are going to be an issue for us in cultivating cannabis. Um, is there anything that you would recommend us to do to rid ourselves of these PPNs other than just bring the soil back into balance? Is there, is there an, you know, an organic solution to these parasitic nematodes or is it as simple as get your soil back into balance and the, the PPNs will just go away? Uh, yeah, that's uh, they don't go away. No. <laughs> <laughs> once, once they're there, let's say you let's say that you've introduced them into uh, your field inadvertently or you just happen to find out that they're there they're there and uh it's extremely difficult to eliminate some of them if they have a if we had nematodes that let's say were hemp specific and that's all they attacked that'd be easy you just um you just not grow hemp on that area for a year or two that would eliminate it but unfortunately there's no evidence of anything specific to hemp the ones that do attack hemp are all have broad host ranges and uh, can survive just fine on the weeds and and uh, anything else you're growing there. So, so, so they so haven't this, targeted our cannabis. We just got unlucky. We don't know yet because we haven't been doing field surveys. Uh, it's Fair been enough. so recently. And there's only, um, only in Alabama, uh, at Auburn and North Carolina State, have they done any field examination at all. We have been doing... Um, we... We have been doing greenhouse work to establish susceptibility and resistance. West Virginia has done. West Virginia University has done a little bit. Um, anybody else? And Florida University of Florida. So, um, so again, uh, you listeners who are looking to get into living soil research, here are more opportunities for you, right, <laughs> to do this study. Well, there's one thing I want, did want to mention, um, and it, it may sound, I don't know how it sounds, but. One of the things that hemp growers could do if, I'm assuming that eventually, if not already, there will be state associations of, of cannabis producers and uh, interested in protecting their markets and all that. One thing that is done a lot for commodities, uh, especially the soybeans and cotton, is to establish state commodity boards that assess a small amount to each grower uh, based on production and to provide that money back to researchers at... Uh, at state or other uh, legitimate universities. 
And that's helpful too, because um, you know, in the, the in the legal outdoor world, they're all growing in different biospheres, right? I mean, the 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 biosphere for growing outdoors where I live uh, in the Pacific Northwest is incredibly different than that in California versus where you are in Tennessee. And right, so right. that that kind of local research, I think, uh, is really important, especially with uh, you know climate change and and everybody's bioregion getting a little wonky. And it's amazing how much research you can get done by giving a researcher a little bit of money. All he wants to feel is a little gratitude. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've got a couple uh, kind of non sequitur questions for you. Sure. So um, uh, it kept on coming up in the literature that um, that you can plant marigolds and let them go year round without cutting them to limit um, nematodes. Um, what's going on there? Why 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 do marigolds limit the the nematodes? Marigold roots produce a substance called patulin that is um, that's toxic to nematodes and reduces and will actually kill them, I believe. Will it get then, rid of our beneficial nematodes as well as the parasitic, or is it mostly about the parasitic because they're eating wow, those that, roots? That's, that's another good question. I'd say that, uh, the, yes, it's probably just the plant parasites, parasites trying to feed on the marigold roots, but I believe it does leach out in the soil. So, oh, yeah. so I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that, and we have touted this in the past in Tennessee too, for home homeowners, you know, small vegetable patches where they get a lot of root knot nematode um, to to uh, grow <laughs> grow marigolds for a year. It might be hard to convince people to broadcast, you know, have a big field of marigolds, but it would be kind of pretty. And I kind of like marigolds. I like the way they smell. And their marigolds are really popular in um, in regenerative cannabis. In fact, uh, many people will actually uh, grow marigolds and and other similar uh, ornamentals as banker or trap plants for beneficial uh, insects, and then right, have right. those near the main body. Uh, oh, and you know, co planted with with cannabis. Those are all good approaches. Yes. Yeah. So uh, another question for you is that um, there is a paper from 1997 that John uh, McPartland put out that's pretty uh, popular in the regenerative cannabis scene it, and he suggests that that you can take a mature cannabis plant and mash it up with a solvent like water or something and then and then strain out the the plant material and then and then use that um, water enriched with um, with cannabis um, you know, essential botan- botanicals uh, as a foliar and a root drench, which will discourage nematodes. Now, one of the things that frustrates a lot of us about that paper is that it doesn't say like where in the cannabis life and if there's only certain parts of the plant and uh, or, or what the active uh, ingredient might be. So we're pretty limited in that. But I was wondering if that, uh, you know, did that, did that tickle your brain in any place where that makes sense to you that, that you know, parts of the, uh, the the resin or maybe even the plant material of the cannabis plant itself might be a discouragement to nematodes. I don't recall John's paper offhand, but uh, uh, a lot of this research has been done mostly in India, where they've used different extracts of, of leaves or roots or the whole plant, uh, and then applied it to in experimental conditions to see whether it... Uh, whether it kills nematodes or causes them to become immobilized or has some negative effect. Um, I'm not aware that, I'm not sure how spraying on the, the leaves would help, but, but using it as a root drench uh, seems to have some effect. I'm, I'm just thinking off, you know, thinking back to the, the Indian papers I've read, which is where this research has been done. And, um, it makes sense to me, and the results I saw in the papers looked like, yeah, that works. The other thing that can be done, though, is is simply uh, once the once the, they've been harvested, and again, I'm I'm in the nematode uh, infection business, so I'm not even all that familiar with how hemp is harvested. Is it cut and then dry, hung to dry, and then har- the flowers are harvested? Correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you only use the flowers. Take the rest of that material and plow it back into the soil. This works for a lot of different crops, just for, even just for the sake of adding more organic matter. But I believe there are there are substances in the leaves and stems 
that probably that have some kind of effect. And also, there are there are uh, smaller varieties of trichomes on many of the stems that that contain the same resins as the flowers. And and you know we know that does all sorts of anti antifungal, antibacterial, oh, yeah, anti inflammation. Yeah. So uh, that wouldn't surprise me if that those were playing a role as well. And you know um, with the uh, natural farming is is really popular and increasing in popularity in cannabis and and specifically the variety known as Korean natural farming and one of the one of the applications of of this system that we're talking about is that um, regenerative farmers are taking the plant material and they're making a fermented plant juice by by taking equal parts plant matter and sugar and uh, in a closed uh, jar and then just letting the plant material break down in the sugar the sugars um, then create like an incubation an incubation environment for those uh, key botanicals and then uh, you know you, you spray it at like you know uh, one five hundred uh, uh, both foliarly um, and then mm-hmm. as a root drench and so it's it's the same kind of experience but makes it more shelf stable. Well, maybe that uh, maybe that helps deter uh, foliar pathogens too. Um, again, I'm not really familiar with that approach. That sounds like uh, the kind of. Um, Kind of experiments that citizen scientists do. Yeah, yeah, it's just exactly trying true. things out. I mean, and that's fine. I, it would, it would be really good to formalize some of those things and actually try them uh, in experimental conditions where they can be, where they can be sure they're working. Um, it, it may work great. So, so we've already uh, don't we, know. we've already established that um, you know as long as we keep our uh, our soil in balance we don't you know the likelihood that we're going to have a problem with parasitic nematodes is low. However, um, uh, the the literature uh, has mentioned a few times uh, this this uh, essentially taking chitin and uh, turning it into a powder um, into something that looks like it's pronounced uh, chitasan and and chitasan chitasan sand thank you and and um because supposedly the 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 nematodes do not like rubbing against it because it's scratchy for them is is this something that you see deployed um (laughs) i've not i've not heard that reason um for why nematodes don't like it but but what we think is going on is that chitin is a good food source for certain fungi that that uh, attack nematodes oh and uh, and they will colonize that chitin, and supposedly, here, here's the reason why. The, nema, the fungi live in soil. There are tra- nematode trapping fungi, uh, nematodes with sticky spores, and all this. They're at pretty low levels most of the time, because we're, we have this soil stasis where everything just kind of stays where it's supposed to be. You add chitin, and this is a good is a good food source for these. Uh, these these fungi um and so they will colonize that and their numbers will increase the nematode gets comes along gets caught um and so that's the idea behind doing it it does work um i i don't know of a whole lot of recent research it was a big flurry of this back in the 80s and 90s because uh, uh producers of uh shrimp products we're overwhelmed by giant piles of, of shrimp shells. What are we gonna do with this material? So grind it up, because it's all chitin, mix it into the soil and see what it does. It does reduce nematode numbers. The amount that, and it may be that this process has become really refined, but the amounts back then per acre were like six to eight tons per acre to see an effect. But putting in that uh, against nematodes, but putting that amount also sometimes led to phytotoxicity. Mm-hmm. Now, there may be more recent research that gets around that, but that's my current understanding. It's interesting too. I think like this this kind of illustrates the difference between sometimes like like there's there is established science and then there's what we call in cannabis bro science, which is essentially myth and unsubstantiated <laughs> rumor that we learned from our mentor, right? And right. and our entire scene is going through a replacement of bro science, which which for most of us we're very emotionally connected to. Me me as well. But but as we get more educated, we learn that some of the things we've learned from our mentors or or forums or magazines when during the prohibition era um that 
it's it's you know it doesn't it doesn't hold up to science and 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 where where I learned about you know the idea that the the chitin um, you know, sc- you know, scraped the nematodes on the outside was was a forums a forum for this, and they were comparing it <laughs> to diatomaceous earth, which which is used for that, right? So that, uh, for example, um, you put diatomaceous earth around your plant, and it will uh, discourage slugs because they don't like to crawl across right. it, right? And so, so it's funny because you know th- that being the you know the reason I gave for it to use it got a chuckle out of you, and then you went ahead and explained the actual science, which is, you know, feed feed the parasitic nematode predator, which is which is you know, an entire di- entirely different de- pro- approach, but actually makes a whole lot more scientific sense. Well, the flip side of um, let's say traditional approaches, uh, the uh, that that have been used for so many years is that uh, a lot of those are going to have threads of uh, real threads of value in them and uh, the, making that connection in the various states getting scientists to hear about these things uh, can promote some useful useful research I mean there there are probably there I'm sure there are many longtime cannabis growers who who grow beautiful cannabis they just have the, the knack or the feel for it um, we have uh, we had a person working here for us at the University of Tennessee in our greenhouse, who I, who, uh, one time I just said she's a hemp whisperer hmm. because she knew, just seemed to know instinctual, instinctively how to grow beautiful tall hemp. She grew hemp ten feet tall in the greenhouse. <laughs> uh, couldn't treat it for insects, so we had to get rid of it. But I mean, she was really good, and uh, and it wasn't that she went through a long course of study. She just had a feel for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and it is interesting, you know. You know, I think that I think that humans have recognized that for years. People having a green thumb, right? And, right. Um, right. And uh, uh, you know, you can you can get to that skill by education or good mentoring. But some people just seem to have the natural vibration for it. And uh, and and I consider yes. them. To, I consider that a talent too. So so uh, let's finish off with this um, uh, kind of an odd question. Uh, so so you know. Can these nematodes, can any of the nematodes that we're going to find around our cannabis cause us harm? So, so you know, the, the literature talks about hookworm, roundworm, whipworm, these different nematodes that can, you know, actually get into the human body and cause us grief. And, you know, the, our, 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 our soils, you know, both outdoors and in the pots are filled with such variety of species, just like we have to be careful with splashing uh, our soil while we're watering our plants because we don't want it necessarily to splash to an adjoining container. Do we need to be aware of the possibility of giving a nematode access to our human while we're working with soil? Because most of us work ungloved pretty intimately with the soil. Yeah, me too, yeah. Uh, The... The chances are, are extremely remote. The only one you mentioned that I would be concerned with in this country it would be hookworm. And hookworm you're going to have only if you have uh, <coughs> if you have pets, especially dogs around, that are defecating on the grounds and you're stepping in it. <laughs> that's that's uh, you know there was a it was a major problem in the South over a century ago, and I we lecture quite a bit of that in my class on hookworm. And, and and how it was eventually brought under control. Um, but as far as these other parasites go, unless you are handling soil that has the eggs of the nematode and then putting your hand in your mouth, you are highly, highly unlikely to get an infection. The way you avoid um, intestinal roundworms is to make sure that you are buying produce that's thoroughly cleaned. But in this country, we don't have much of a problem. We do see infections. Um, Sometimes around uh, where there are there's animal waste flowing down into a field, uh, occasionally out of other countries, uh, but people who are resident in those countries uh, sometimes have really serious infections. Here, uh, no, but if anyone ever starts getting severe 
intestinal pains, they should see their doctor right away. Yeah, because so, it does exist. So it sounds like uh, you know, uh, keep your keep your grow area clean, uh, uh, wash right. your hands, and keep your hands out of your mouth, you heathen. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I've handled I've handled soil all my life with my bare hands. Uh, I wear gloves only if it's there's something I'm mixing up. And never, never I've, as far as I know, I don't have a problem. Right on. <laughs> well, well, Dr. Bernard, thank you so much for taking your time out of your very busy schedule to, it's to, been my to, to hang out with us. You know, it's. Um, I, I said in the introduction to the show that um, it was it was very challenging to find a nematologist who was um, well. A, I could even I could even make contact with, but who was also open and interested in speaking about cannabis because there was this kind of like general idea that. There's just not a lot of the research has been done yet, and and I really appreciate that you you chose to step up to the plate and say, all right, there's there's all these gaps in what we know, but I do know nematodes, and so I will give it the best <laughs> shot. So so I appreciate your you know your courage in coming on the show and and, do it. and sharing your your depth of knowledge with us um, and and the little bit that we know about how nematode interacts with with cannabis. You're quite welcome. Fantastic. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you would leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news, exclusive videos, and giveaways. On the Shaping Fire website, you'll also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. Be sure to follow on Instagram for all original content not found on the podcast. That's at Shaping Fire and at Shango Los on Instagram. Be sure to check out the Shaping Fire YouTube channel for exclusive interviews, farm tours, and cannabis lectures. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping